Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Creepy Fox Podcast with your host, the Creepy Fox. Tonight, join me for an hour of true scary stories that are going to chill you to the bone. Make sure to sit back, relax, grab yourself some snacks, and let's begin. Be careful who you meet. This takes place when I lived in Alaska. I'm a 21-year-old college student, and I was using a dating app one day after class. Perhaps you may be familiar with this certain application. Does Tinder ring a bell? Mark messaged me, and he complimented me on my looks, saying I was pretty, amongst other kind words. I thanked Mark, to which almost immediately he asked for my phone number. Foolishly, I gave him that information, not realizing it. I had just set myself up for some of the most scariest series of events that were going to happen thus far. Mark began to text me almost immediately, and he actually asked me out. I told him I didn't have time for a date because I was busy with a school project that would be due later that week. Fast forward to the weekend. I'm at home and both my parents had left for a business trip. With me was my brother who was downstairs playing video games. As for my sister, she had taken my little sisters to the movies. The time was roughly 10pm, and I was in my room texting one of my friends. Out of nowhere, I hear what sounds like the side door to our backyard opening. I looked out there, and I was able to see a figure moving in the dark. Instantly, I get up to grab my phone, but before I could dial for help, My brother runs upstairs, yelling for me to call the police. We proceeded to hide in the bathroom, as I was soon connected with our local police department. I now began to explain our current situation, as we hear the stranger who entered our home walk up the stairs. Moments later, we hear the door handle of the restroom begin to jingle. Since it was locked, he starts to bang on the door, as my brother and I are sitting there, in absolute shock. A few minutes pass, and we hear police sirens in the distance. Footsteps are then heard running down the stairs, and outside we hear officers telling someone to freeze. Another couple of minutes later, the police come up to the restroom, and they tell us it's safe to come outside. When we walk with them to the front of the house, they tell my brother and I the man who broke in had a knife, rope, and gloves inside a bag. The officers explain further this intruder had photos of me on their phone. Talk about creepy. Next, the officers called my parents and explained the situation that had just occurred. Last I've heard, the man was sentenced to four months in prison. What a lack of justice, I'll tell you. So, if there is a learning lesson I can pass on to you, it's this. If you're going to meet someone from the internet, always make sure to take somebody with you and make sure to meet in a public location. The Back Roads of Anchorage What is it about people having to go out of their way to ruin a perfect date? No, I'm not talking about the plot to a movie, although I wish I was. Instead, this is a true scary event that happened to me and my girlfriend, now my wife, in the late 2000s, while we were still in college. This takes place in Anchorage, Alaska, and it's during the winter. It was our very first date, and I had invited her to watch a movie. The movie ended at about 7pm, and afterwards we go to have some dinner. An hour and a half later, after we make it back to the car, I asked my girlfriend if she wanted to go watch the planes take off. For those who don't live in Anchorage, I'll give you a quick rundown. Our airport is called Ted Stevens International. On the right side of the airport, you can take these back roads where you drive into a forest of sorts. Eventually, it shoots you out toward the back end of the airport. There is a peninsula at the very end where cars will park and hang out. It's a great spot not only for watching planes, but just being away from the busy life of the city. However, as it's so far from civilization, you are sort of in the middle of nowhere. That means, let's say somebody was out there being a troublemaker. It's up to you to defend yourself by any means possible 
if that person decides to come after you. So it takes us approximately 30 minutes of driving to get to the spot in question. And as we pull into this parking area, my headlights reveal the location is empty, say apart from the piles of snow covering some of the parking spots. I do recall it being a comfortable 25 to 30 degrees, which meant both me and my girlfriend stood outside for a little while with our Starbucks coffee and watched planes arriving and taking off. There's just something so spectacular about seeing these ginormous aerial vehicles maneuvering the way they do makes you thankful for the ability to travel by air. At some point in between our bad jokes and our conversations, we were interrupted by a large vehicle's headlights driving down the lonely back road we had arrived from. The vehicle, which we were able to identify as a gray Ford F-150, passes the parking area, only to turn back moments later. We stood there and watched the vehicle as it stationed itself just a few parking spots from where we stood. Two grizzly men jumped out moments later, and they began lighting up some smokes and taking drinks from their little canisters, the kinds you put liquor in. Hey, you two want some? The driver asks my girlfriend and I. We tell him no as my girlfriend gives me a friendly nudge, as if to say she wants to go back home. I couldn't blame her. Something about these guys was giving us really bad vibes. I wasn't trying to assume or be judgmental, but there was just something screaming in my head telling me, leave now. So we begin making our way to the doors, which we were just a few feet away from, and we notice the man approaching. We don't even get the chance to put on our seat belts when one of the men walks to the back of my vehicle and the other stands in the front. Hey, where are you two going? Don't you want to hang out and have some drinks? This was the first time hearing the second man, who sounded a lot more buzzed than the first. The man at the back starts pounding on my car, blocking our escape, as he begins rocking the vehicle back and forth. Meanwhile, the man at the front is telling my girlfriend to step outside and leave me out here in the middle of nowhere as they go to a hotel. My girlfriend is visibly shaking and I'm really beginning to get furious at these two. I told my girlfriend I was going to go outside and confront them, but to this day, I'm so glad I didn't. I flipped them off instead, to which the one at the back responded by taking out a knife. The creep then begins to approach the driver's seat. He then starts to pull at the door handle. Meanwhile, the other is on the passenger side, trying to do the same. Thank goodness the man at the back had moved, and I was able to back up and leave them dressed in a thick layer of snow, thanks in part to my tires, and we began flooring it. It seemed we had escaped our so-called stalkers, only to realize the two weren't finished. Less than a minute later, my girlfriend reaches for my arm, and she tells me to look into the rearview mirror. There they were, quickly approaching her vehicle. Panic is flowing through my veins as my girlfriend calls 911 and tells the dispatch we're being chased just outside of Ted Stevens International Airport by a group of, what I can recall her naming them, thugs. The next minute or so I'm speeding up, just hoping I don't bump into any sort of large rocks or slip off the road. Thank the skies above that the two in the Ford F-150 start to slow their approach as we reached the more lit up part of Anchorage. Just as quickly as these two had appeared and what seemed to be like a calculated plan being thwarted, the two disappeared into the winter night for us to never see them again. To be perfectly frank, we don't know if officers ever caught the two since we never heard anything back. To this day, my wife still gets goosebumps anytime she sees a gray Ford F-150. Don't mess with Sam. Any one of you enjoy a nightly walk in the crisp summer evening? Come on, show of hands, I know it's not just me. Who doesn't enjoy grabbing a latte, calling up a friend and walking your dog as the breeze passes by your rose-colored cheeks? Sorry, I'm reminiscing of a time when we could go out and enjoy being ourselves. Due to all this stuff happening in the world, most of us are stuck at home doing whatever we can to stay sane. I won't get into that since everybody has their own opinions. 
So instead, I want to focus on something pretty weird that happened to me last month. I live in a gated off community with my mom and dad in middle America that rarely sees any sort of activity, if you want to refer to it as such. You might see a neighbor or two having a barbecue or a party, but when it comes to creepy things, that's normally kept to the movies. That's why I'm always so confident being out at night, even when I'm not in the safety of my gated neighborhood. There's just this sort of false confidence that makes me feel like I can't be touched. So, I want to refer to you an incident when I was hanging out with one of my best friends, who we're going to call Sam. There's this mom and pop donut shop that is normally open until 2am, about 10 minutes from my neighborhood, which we like to hang out at. It's in this small shopping center that has a Sprouts grocery store and a PetSmart. Now, we mainly go to this donut shop since my dad knows the owners and they give us discounts. But we also like to go just to get away from home. Due to the current restrictions, we were only allowed to pick up donuts from the drive through window, but we could sit outside on the benches. Oh, and also they closed at 9pm instead of 2am. Which, just a quick update as I'm about to submit this story. They just announced they would start closing at their normal 2am time. Continuing with my story. Sam and I spent about 20 minutes eating a couple of donuts and watching a Vsauce video on my phone. It was the one about the holes. I remember because we laughed at the thumbnail. I guess we were so distracted by Michael's voice that we hadn't realized there was this man who was sitting a couple of benches apart from where we sat, just looking over at us. Sam was the one to point him out as he looked in our direction. Hey, there's some dude looking over at us, Sam whispered with his mask muffling his speech. I looked away from my phone for a brief moment, and the man, who I can describe as tall, skinny, with long, thin hair and acne across his face, quick note, he didn't have any facial covering, turned his attention toward his pockets as he takes out a lighter and lights a cigarette. We both ignored him, but we did find his hundred miles stare a bit awkward. In the brief moments we made eye contact, I genuinely felt this sudden feeling of doom come over me. I don't know why, but all the years of feeling safe and secure melted away like ice cream on a hot summer's afternoon. We ignored him, and after a minute or two, he got up and left. That feeling of being secure had returned, and we began to relax. When the video was finished and our donuts were sitting comfortably in our stomachs, we got up, and we began heading back to our neighborhood. Now, we had two options. We could take the streets, but that would have taken longer. That's why we decided to use the back alleyway, since it's twice as fast. Plus, we don't have to worry about waiting at the two traffic signals. About halfway through this long, poorly lit alleyway that extends a few blocks, there are some apartments with a small parking structure and some dumpsters. There's also a patch of grass where a lot of times we'll pass by the area and we'll see the residents taking their dogs to use the restroom. This evening, however, it was empty. No signs of people. Yet. We were just a few feet from the back of the apartments when we see a familiar face. The man who we saw at the donut shop walked out from behind a dumpster. He proceeds to stop right in front of Sam and I then calls out somebody's name. I think it was Adrian or something. It was definitely with an A. Our attention is now focused toward the dumpsters as we see a man holding a Dos Equis bottle fumble his way over to what we assumed was his friend. Look dude, we don't want any trouble. We're just trying to get back home. I tell him as I begin to freak out. Give us your phones and your wallet. Now. Sam scoffed at their remarks and asked them if they were crazy. Guess they may have been because the first dude takes out a pocket knife and then reaffirms his statement. Now, Sam has always been very protective of me. I'm pretty much the only close female friend he's ever had and he considers me like a sister. Thankfully, I know that Sam has taken years of self-defense courses, so if there was anybody I wanted to be around during an attempted mugging, it would be Sam. Like a light switch suddenly flipping, the man with the knife lunges in our direction as Sam pushes me to the side, causing me to fall on my rear end. This was the first time I'd ever seen Sam use his self-defense training in person. His movements were so fluid and the way he disarmed the man with the knife was like something straight out of a movie. 
Now with the weapon in hand, both men start to back up. They look at each other, and almost as if to say, this isn't worth it, they booked it. I was so thankful for Sam that I immediately gave him a hug. A few moments later, we hear somebody call out to us from above. It was a woman from the apartment who had just witnessed the latter half of the fight where Sam had disarmed the creep. She says she was on the line with the police who were sending a couple of officers to get those two. We joined her and her husband, and as we waited, we called our parents to advise them of what had just happened. My dad, being the overprotective father he is, didn't even change. He drove over in his pajamas and slippers and picked Sam and I up, but that's not before we talked to the police, who luckily were able to locate the two. That was a month ago, and even though the whole incident was just really bizarre, we still like to go out, albeit we stick to more populated locations, and we make sure to follow our current safety protocols. Housekeeping Gone Wrong I don't think I've heard a story on your channel as of late that takes place during the current lockdown, so perhaps I can be one of the first. To give you just a quick insight at what I do, I'm a 50-year-old single mom who runs my own cleaning services. People can call me up and I'll go to their home and clean. One of my clients owns a vacation home here in Southern California, and she has me check up on the place at least once a week. If for whatever reason she asks me to do something, like clean or dust, I'll take care of it. Although I hardly have to clean, since she rarely visits. However, this day that she called me, she advised me she had been in town, and she threw a huge party just the previous evening. Unfortunately, she had to leave that same afternoon, but she did ask me if I could come clean. It was actually my day off, and I almost said no, but she's always been really considerate of me. She even gave my daughter a thousand dollars, just for graduating college. Well, I let her know I could head over there at around 6.30 p.m., since I was at the mall with my daughter and son. Fast forward to later that afternoon, I drove 45 minutes to the beach where her vacation home is located. Right away, I was able to tell I would have quite a bit of a job ahead of me. Just to give you a visual, there was a bunch of plastic red cups on countertops, confetti spread across the carpet, and even pieces of a piñata. Must have been a grand old time. I began by taking the trash out, and then I started to vacuum. This chore of taking out the trash and vacuuming and sweeping had me busy for at least an hour. Finally, I managed to catch a break and I take a seat on the couch to relax. I was actually talking to my son on the phone who had just called me, and for whatever reason my peripheral vision catches the glimpse of a dark figure that walks past the window. There is a curtain, mind you but any persons or persons can easily cast a shadow, thanks in part to the automatically installed lights. I assumed it might have been one of the neighbors and I ignored this sudden appearance, returning my attention to my phone. When I was finished talking to my son, I returned to my vehicle to grab some extra gloves and sponges since I was going to begin cleaning the restrooms. That was the last thing I had to do before I could go home. Here's when I noticed something a bit bizarre. That backed up my earlier assumption. My client's home, along with the neighbors, are very close to the beach. Therefore, it's not surprising to see muddy footprints. But these are normally from kids. I heard no sounds of kids. These were definitely print sizes coming from an adult. I followed the muddy shoe prints, and they eventually teetered off toward the sand. No conclusion, which is why I decided to get back to work. After all, I was pretty tired to begin with, and I just wanted to get back home so I could take a shower. So, I'm in the upstairs restroom cleaning. This is a two-story vacation home. And all of a sudden, I began to hear footsteps walking in the downstairs living room. I sorta just stood there confused for a few seconds. My client should have been on a plane halfway to Arizona. So, who was in the house? Well, little did I know that in my rush to get to my work, I left the front door unlocked. I walked over to the railing that overlooks the living room, and I managed to catch the glimpse of somebody walking into the kitchen with a knife. 
I put my hand in my mouth and I did the best I could to muffle my screams. Who the heck was this guy? Why was he in here? My instincts told me it was better not to ask. I locked myself in the restroom, turned off the lights, and then I proceeded to call 911. Those next 10 minutes of waiting felt like an eternity. It was made worse when the intruder walked up the stairs and then attempted to open the restroom. My heart began to pound out of my chest as I continued to hold in my screams and just beg help would arrive. Thankfully, the intruder gave up and I hear their footsteps walk over to the master bedroom, which was next to me. I hear drawers being opened and furniture tossed left and right. I continued to monitor the noise while relaying as much information to the operator as I could. Finally, it seemed that whoever had walked into my home had left because the footsteps had gone silent. Officers arrived and checked the entire property. I could see neighbors walk out of their homes from the small restroom window and I got a sense of relief knowing I was safe. An officer came up to the restroom and knocked on the door telling me it was safe to step outside. I was still scared. Honestly, could you blame me? That's why I asked if he could show me his badge by slipping it underneath the door. Needless to say, the guy who broke in had gotten away. No neighbor had seen him leave or arrive, guess since it was dark. Nobody really paid attention. The strangest part about this entire thing is that nothing was taken, which I guess is a good thing? I don't know. Either way, I don't want to be inside a home and have some random man show up with a blade. I could have been taken in Germany. To this day, I'm very thankful for having a friend with me. I honestly think that if it weren't for him, things might be different for me. And I'm not saying that just to say it. I really do mean it. Back in 2013, I was going through a pretty rough patch in my life. I'd rather not get into it, but I will say that I needed to get away from home. That spring semester, just a few weeks before finals, I started looking into group vacation tours. If you're completely lost with what I'm talking about, I'll just give you a quick TLDR. They are essentially tours that you can sign up with that will take you to various cities and countries. The more popular one, such as the one I did, was a two-week group tour through Europe in which you were guided by a couple of tour guides. The size of the group depends. For example, Mine was 25. Normally, you'll stay in one city for two days. One to learn its history and check out the landmarks, and then another to do shopping and your own exploration. I mainly wanted to do this guided tour as a way to see the world, since my parents always encouraged me to do so. Now, because this story could potentially become a novel, I'm not going to tell you about each and every city we stayed in and the boring events that took place. If anybody wants to hear the full story, I could always write it out. And I could ask the creepy fox to include it as an extra for a future video, since I love his voice. I want to focus on night number two when we were staying in Berlin, Germany. By this point in the tour, it had been a little over a week and I had made friends with another person in my group. We're going to call him Alex. Alex is 26 years old and from New Jersey. Meanwhile, I'm 24 years old and I'm from Portland, Oregon. Alex and I decided to meet up at around 5 p.m. so that we could take a walk in the food market. Who knew that walk would turn into hours of talking and buying? I can't tell you how many souvenirs I bought just in that city. By 7 p.m. we're starting to get pretty hungry. One of the shop owners we talked to that was selling some handmade dream catchers recommended a bakery just around the corner from where she was. She said her nephew owned the place and even told us to tell him her name and that we were friends with her so that we could get a discount. Honestly, that old lady was too sweet for words. Too bad this is the point in the story when things would go from fun and innocent to downright terrifying. Now, I want to bring up that I don't speak any German, but Alex is fluent. That's why he was the translator. So we did end up going to that bakery. And just like the woman said, their sandwiches were incredible. Alex and I decided to sit outside along with some other guests. And it's while we're talking, Alex overheard something that seemed to raise alarms. Alex, what's the deal? Why do you look so paranoid? 
Do you have your phone on you? I'm going to pretend to text somebody, but I'm texting you. I want you to read what I'm going to tell you. Don't ask. Strange flex, but okay. I played along with this little game, all the while I can see him looking behind me. We were using WhatsApp in case you're wondering. I received his message, and it said something along the lines of this. Try not to freak out, but I could have sworn the guys behind you mentioned something about grabbing you when we leave the restaurant. I looked at Alex, and I suddenly burst into laughter. <laughs> Alex, you're too funny, aren't you? As if something like that would really happen. Alex reassured me he wasn't joking, but he did admit it was possible he might have just been hearing things. Either way, Alex continued to talk to me, while paying close attention to the men that were sitting at the table just inches from where I was. When dessert arrived, Alex got up from her table, and then without holding anything back, shouted something to the men in German. I won't even attempt writing that part out in German, but I'll write it out in English from what he later told me. I don't know what you two are planning, but keep it up, and the police will be called. I finally took this opportunity to look in the direction of where Alex spoke, and I could see the look of shock on those men's faces. I'm not one to judge, but there was something about the smirks on their faces that read, Danger. Alex proceeded to leave money on the table, and then grab my hand. We left that restaurant, but I was trying to get Alex to stop and explain why exactly he let out that outburst, since I'm pretty sure they weren't expecting him to speak German. I know what I heard. They were talking about taking you. I was lost for words by that statement, and I started thinking of all the stories I'd read about people being taken in different countries. We ultimately decided to head back to the hotel, but to make things even worse, the two men from the restaurant were stalking us. Meanwhile, one of them was on the phone speaking to somebody. It wasn't until we were just across the street from the hotel that we see the men get into a vehicle, and they slowly drive beside us while staring at us. Then, they go away never to be seen again. Now I know my submission may not be the scariest thing you might have heard, and I don't blame you for thinking that. But just imagine for a second. Imagine being in a country where you don't even know the language, where you got some strange dudes talking about taking you. I can safely say that if Alex wasn't there, or if he didn't speak German, I may have never made it back home. Thankfully, we were able to put the experience behind ourselves because we went to Paris the following day. I still keep in touch with Alex, and I contacted him just a week ago so that he could help me recount this tale to submit to you. I even got him into your channel, and he told me he would send you a couple of his own scary stories. I'm sure they're better than mine. Gas stations bring out the freaks. This story comes from my younger years, when I was still living in Mexico with my mom and my dad. I was in my late teens, so we're talking mid-2000s. I was jumping from job to job, trying to make some extra funds. It's because I was looking at getting my very own car, since my parents didn't have much money. I worked at grocery stores, restaurants, and even did things like cutting grass and cleaning homes. Perhaps out of all these lines of work, the six months I worked at a Pemex saw me dealing with some, for lack of better words, interesting situations. For those who don't know, Pemex is one of the, if not the largest, petroleum company in all of Mexico. Anyways, apart from the occasional rude customer, you had the occasional people who try to steal things. Thankfully, we had security cameras, thus these instances were kept to a minimum. That still didn't stop some people from doing what they wanted. I refer you to an evening when I was working the night shift. It was just myself as our Pemex was rather lonely and slow. I recall it being around 1 in the morning and I'm sitting at the front counter reading the newspaper and listening to my portable radio. Suddenly I heard the chimes at the front door opening and I can see a man mid to late 40s walk in with his hands in his pockets. I say hello, and I tell him that if there was anything he needed, I was here. He gave me a head nod, and then he disappeared into the back aisle. I returned to the newspaper and awaited this customer's return. Five minutes come and go, and I think maybe he went to the restroom. I give it another ten minutes, and I'm genuinely getting curious. 
I look at the security monitor, but I just barely get to see any activity since the angling of the camera was pretty bad. So I use this opportunity to stretch my legs and walk over in the direction I'd last seen him. I couldn't believe what he was doing. There he sat in front of the refrigerators where all the drinks are, munching on some chips and drinking a Budweiser. There was already an empty can that sat next to him. Este, disculpa, pero ya sabes que necesitas pagar para todo esto, ¿verdad? Or for those who don't speak any Spanish. Excuse me, sir, but you do realize you need to pay for all this, right? I firmly expressed, putting my foot down and taking the chips away from his grasp. The man rips the bag of chips away from my hands and then continues to eat and drink. I gave him the opportunity to apologize, but now he was just making me angry and a fool. I proceeded to tell him that if he doesn't pay, I was going to get the police on the line. That was all it took for this guy to burst into anger. He drops the Budweiser and chips, jumps straight up, and then pushes me, which causes me to bump into a display. Tú no me puedes decir que puedo ser niño. Or in English, you don't tell me what to do, kid. The man was getting serious, but so was I. I start to get up, but in the process I see him fumbling for something in his pocket. Moments later I'm staring at one of the sharpest knives I'd ever seen. I remember time going into slow motion and thinking, I need to move. For whatever reason, and to this day I still can't explain it, my body wouldn't budge, even though my brain was practically yelling at me. If anyone knows why people do this, then it would be greatly appreciated. I've read in some places it has to do with a part of your brain that deals with fear, but I'm not too sure. Nevertheless, I snapped out of it when the man was just inches from slashing at my shirt. I backed up and then I booked it toward the front counter. Even if this guy was holding on to a knife, there was a surprise. A baseball bat, which I kept hidden underneath the front counter. I flew over that front counter, bumping into another display in the process, and I grasped that bat. As I peek up to look at where the man was, I can see him just walking down the aisle he had chased me away from. I reveal the baseball bat, and he stops just a mere few feet from where I stood. He stared at me for a solid ten seconds, as if thinking to himself, should I risk it, or should I leave? He chose to leave, but not before he used some very colorful language. By some sort of miracle, two police officers had stopped to get some gas, and they ended up catching up with the man. I watch from inside the convenience store as they get him into handcuffs and into the back of their vehicle. I then went up to the officers and told them that the man had tried charging at me with a knife and had been eating slash drinking some of our products. I showed them some of the security footage as well as the leftover food before they wrote down some notes and took my statement. Fast forward a few days later, my boss told me that the man who had come into the store that night I was working had just recently been let out of jail on charges of robbery and theft. He sure didn't take too long to get back behind bars. But hey, at least I didn't turn out to be another face or statistic in the newspaper. Face to face with the robber. This took place about five years prior. I live in a really safe community in the United Kingdom where the only break-in ever reported in my area was over 20 years ago. This gave me a sort of false confidence in which I thought I'd be in peace and never have to worry about any sort of burglar, let alone a break-in. One day while I was taking my dog for a walk, I noticed a person in a black hoodie with the hood up. I didn't think much of them because the fashion in the Northeast United Kingdom consists of hoodies and tracksuit bottoms. In any case, when exiting the garden of my house, there is this large walkway, where you can either take a left or right, which is a tight path, mind you, that fits only one person. I usually chose to take this path so that I can get a shortcut to my home, which is when I saw the person looking at my home. I stood there until they noticed me, only for them to walk away, without saying a single word. Again, I didn't really mind, since people are usually rude, and won't even bother to say hello. Fast forward to the evening, 
I was playing some games, and then after I got tired, I decided on getting some sleep. Now I do have to mention before I continue that I was born with an ear infection, which means I can't hear out of my left ear. I normally sleep on my right ear, meaning I usually get uninterrupted sleep. At around 1 in the morning, I noticed that the gap under my door had suddenly been illuminated. I began to wonder as I laid in my bed what was going on. Well, all of a sudden, I hear my dog go into a crazy fit. I have the type of dog that's very quiet, which means if you're looking for peace, he's got you covered. But to hear him going crazy the way he was made me believe something serious was happening. This sudden disturbance was followed by my stepdad shouting to my mom, who was downstairs. My curtains were open, since I do like to have some light in my room because I have a large window. When I looked at said window, I saw someone who was only identifiable due to the automatic light switching on. This person starts to run away, and I began suspecting something was up. It's at this very moment I noticed my parents had started to lock up the home, but when I went into the kitchen, I saw it had been raided by the person. Perhaps what really caught me off guard was the garage. My stepdad has these tools that were given to him by his father who had passed away many years ago. They are extremely rare, and unfortunately, they were missing. We called the police, obviously, and they began a wide search of the immediate neighborhood the man had run off to. The tools were located in a bag, which had been buried, most likely because the burglar had heard the police and attempted to hide them. As for what else was stolen, he took off with some money, my mom's purse, and my stepdad's wallet. The idiot didn't even wear anything to conceal his hands, and the police were able to find out who had broken in, but couldn't actually locate his whereabouts. A week or two later, he was arrested for breaking and entering, and stealing. For those wondering, he broke into my house by grabbing a brick, and then proceeding to smash the lock on the garage. That's how he was able to lift up the garage door. From there, he tried entering my home, but my dog blocked the entrance to the kitchen door, and sent the guy packing in fear. I don't know what happened after he was caught, until a few months ago, where I overheard from my stepdad that the man was going to get released. My stepdad was double-checking all the locks on the doors, which he's never been the cautious type, by the way. Oh, and I never mentioned the guy was looking at my house to my stepdad, since I didn't think much of it. So that was the time I came face to face with the man who ended up robbing my home. An unusual home intruder. Anyone else ever showed up at home only to stumble into a complete stranger? Please tell me I'm not the only one this has ever happened to. Before I get too ahead, let me just give you some quick information. I'm a 23 year old female still living at home with my mom and dad in a neighborhood that's relatively safe from crime. The night this occurred, both my mom and dad were out visiting my uncle and aunt who were celebrating their wedding anniversary. This meant that when I got out of work and showed up at home at approximately 1 in the morning, everything was pretty quiet, say apart from the crickets that were chirping. Considering how tired I was, I went straight to bed, and I crashed almost immediately. Fast forward about an hour later, I'm startled out of my sleep when I hear something fall over in the kitchen. First thing I did was look at my phone and checked to see if perhaps my parents had texted me, telling me they had returned. I already knew they would be out for a few days, so there was no chance it was them. Next, I checked for my cat, since he does like to occasionally cause a mess. He was laying in his little bed, but I do see all the hairs on his back are standing up. Now, I've always been the sort of person who lets my emotions control many situations I'm put through. Even though my brain was telling me to lock the door, part of me wanted to go investigate the sudden noise. Perhaps a squirrel or a raccoon managed to get through our little dog door, which we have installed for our cat. I armed myself with my pepper spray, and then I start to make my way down the hallway. Halfway, you can turn to your right and you see the kitchen. Since there was a full moon, the light coming in from the window was casting shadows into the hallway. This was when I came to the conclusion. I wasn't dealing with an animal, but instead, a human being, as this shadow figure was tall. So, 
I jumped into the kitchen trying to surprise whoever was there, and I managed to catch someone going through my refrigerator, drinking out of one of the milk cartons. Excuse me, but do you live here? I exclaimed, grasping my pepper spray ever so tightly. I actually recognized this intruder. He was a homeless man in his early 30s who was well known in my area for being a junkie. From what I've heard, he had been arrested in the past and was known to be dangerous. But what the heck was he doing in my home? I didn't know, but I could care less about that. I was more concerned that he needed to leave, and he needed to leave now. I need you to get out. This isn't your house. He kind of just sat there staring while beginning to jitter back and forth. He then started making up excuses saying he lived here and that he was friends with the owner. I reassured him my parents knew nothing of him and reminded him that I was just about to call the police. He panicked and he started going into a crazy fit. Most of what he said after this was unintelligible and it was really beginning to freak me out. I began to back up because I saw him reach for one of the knives in the sink. I booked it toward my room as I can hear his footsteps running down the hallway and my heart is beating out of my chest. Once I'm in my room, I slid a chair in front of the door lock, hoping it would be enough to keep that door from crashing down. Seconds later, I could hear him pounding on the door, telling me he was going to cut me up into bit-sized pieces. No joke. I still sometimes have nightmares where he actually manages to get into my room. Luckily, I hear his footsteps begin to go silent, but this didn't stop me from calling authorities. They showed up about six to seven minutes later. They found him hiding underneath my front porch. No further altercation occurred, and they were able to get him cuffed. We were able to determine that he managed to make his way into my home through an unlocked window, which I'd forgotten to close. Yeah, I take full blame for that. By the time everything settled, I was too scared to stay at home, so I grabbed my cats and we ended up waking up my best friend and spending the night at her home. The following morning, I called my parents and I explained the entire incident. We have since had our locks changed and we've had somebody install these really nice bars over our windows. Also, I did say that part of this was my fault, but why should I have to worry about somebody coming into my home just because I left that window unlocked? I'm not exactly sure, but part of me feels that guy had been staking out my home because... Why would he choose mine over others? Not what you would expect. My story is kind of an interesting one in that it doesn't involve a stalker or some creepy guy. Don't get the wrong idea, I do enjoy those sorts of stories. But after you've heard so much of creepy guy gives creepy smile and then says something creepy but nothing else happens, you're going to start to get burned out. Anyways, this was just a week before Christmas in 2010 and takes place just outside of a small town called Indiana in Pennsylvania. To start you off, I had driven to the airport in Pittsburgh to pick up a friend who would be spending the holiday with me and my family. This was his first time he'd ever been here. I was really excited he chose to spend Christmas with me. We had all these plans set up, such as going ice skating, building snowmen, and just watching movies in the living room with endless bowls of popcorn. I picked him up in front of Terminal A, and the first thing I remember him telling me was, you weren't kidding when you said dress in layers, it's freezing out here. My friend Charles is from Las Vegas, and even though they sometimes get cold temperatures in the winter, nothing compares to a winter in PA. On the way back to Indiana while singing along to Christmas songs, I mentioned to my friend that there is this gas station that sells this really amazing hot chocolate. I sort of teased him any time we talked over the phone because he's a huge fan of hot chocolate. Well, at last he would be able to try it and I could stop giving him a hard time. We get to this little gas station at about a quarter past 9pm and it's completely deserted, as expected at this time of year and night. When we walked into the little convenience store, I showed my friend toward the back where the hot chocolate machine was located. There were little Christmas ornaments lining the machine, with a plastic Christmas tree that sat peacefully beside the dispenser. The cup holders that held the small, medium, and large cups were wrapped in Christmas lights that danced along to the Christmas carols that played over the intercom. 
While Charles decided which drinks and toppings he wanted, I told him I was going to use the restroom. No issue for him, since he also wanted to get some little souvenirs. Now, this next part I didn't actually witness myself, but thanks to my friend, he has been able to help me write out what happened, up to the point I witnessed things with my own eyes. My friend described that as he looked at some of the little souvenirs, he saw someone just outside the window, pacing back and forth. He described them as paranoid, shaky, and appearing to be out of breath. My friend says that he tried waving at him to see if maybe he needed something, but the man continued to walk back and forth while fumbling for something in his sweater. Charles continued to look at little knickknacks before heading to the cashier so that he could pay. Now, Charles has always been the outgoing and friendly kind of individual, so he hit it off with the cashier, sort of as if they were long-lost friends. This was the moment where our evening was going to take a turn for the worst. All of a sudden, Charles hears the bells from the front door chime. The man Charles had seen pacing back and forth some minutes prior had come into the store. He's now grasping a pistol. Charles describes adrenaline being shot into his veins as he does his best to control his heart rate and remain calm. Charles says that he puts his hands up as this would-be robber tells the cashier to put all the money the store had into a plastic bag. The cashier tells him to give him a second as he reaches below the front counter. What Charles, myself, or the robber didn't know was that this gas station clerk was packing heat. Not just any sort of heat. A pump-action shotgun. The man with the pistol immediately runs out of the store, but not before tripping and falling, thanks in part to a Slim Jim display. The pistol went flying, and Charles, bless his heart and bravery, grabs said pistol. The man didn't even bother to retrieve it. He booked it out of the store, and Charles says he sees him running across the parking lot and disappearing into the nearby wilderness. I witnessed this last part, where Charles had picked up the pistol. So now that we're reunited in the story, I explain to you what happened next. I called 911 from my cell phone as the cashier told us to remain by his side. Thankfully, officers were dispatched in a matter of minutes and soon alleviate our stress and fears by taking our information. Meanwhile, a few other officers go and check the nearby woods. The man, thank goodness, didn't get too far, and he was caught. The officers praised both the cashier and Charles on their quick thinking. I don't think Charles was expecting to thwart a would-be robber, but what a story he had to tell his mom and dad when we made it back to my house. For the rest of the time Charles spent with my family and I was very peaceful, and even all these years later, we'll sometimes bring up that incident, and we'll have ourselves... A good laugh. Fake Inspector I'm a 34-year-old male security guard who works for a metal refinery, and I've been here for a little over three years. Any of my fellow security guard friends out there know that this line of work is very tough. Not so much for the work, since all we're doing in my case is keeping buildings safe and secure, but more so on your sleep schedule. At my site, it's very common for me to work 6 days a week, 12 hours a day. There have even been some rare instances I had to work on my days off because we had security guards who would call out with what I swear were some of the lamest excuses I'd ever heard. They mainly tended to be the younger kids in their early 20s that were looking to go out and party with their friends. Anyways, my scary encounter happened on one of these nights where a co-worker called out saying they couldn't make it due to a flat tire. I was just getting over a cold myself and I was pretty grumpy, but my boss offered me double pay, which made it totally worth it. I mean, come on, 30 bucks an hour? How could I refuse? I showed up at 6 p.m. and mentally prepared myself for another 12-hour shift. The first half goes by pretty quietly. It was right before the 4th of July holiday weekend, which meant most workers and any deliveries were kept to a minimum. At midnight, I was joined by another co-worker, who we're going to call John. He's an older security guard in his mid-50s and has been working at this refinery for almost 15 years. We are pretty close, 
and so he kept me company and helped me stay awake. At around 2am, as we wrote up some paperwork, I switched to various different cameras on my CCTV system. This was when I managed to catch somebody walking past one of the cameras. I tell John, I was going to go check up on our possible intruder and he keeps an eye on the cameras. I got into her little company vehicle and drove a minute to the back end of the building. Any sign of a person, John? I say over my radio, finally arriving to the last location I'd seen this person. No, I don't see them. Are you sure you weren't just seeing things? I reassured John I wasn't and started inspecting some of the doorways. At last, I located our possible intruder. Someone in a hoodie, with the hood up, trying to open one of the doors. Excuse me, sir, but do you have any reason to be here? Like a kid being caught red-handed, they stop what they're doing and look in my direction. Yeah, actually, I'm an inspector. You didn't get the call? I played along with his game, as I can see he's getting visibly upset and nervous. No, I didn't. Let me call my boss and confirm, okay? I didn't call my boss, but I did call John and told him as loudly as I could to call the police. Turned out they were already on the way since John had seen the man on the cameras. The man, hearing he was about to get busted, runs past me and I watch him reach for our fencing. He then crawls into some bushes and reappears on the other side of the fence moments later. Now, I'm not going to spend hours getting to what happened, so I'll just summarize. The man was caught 15 minutes later, and it's what police found on the person that really made this encounter that much more terrifying. They found he was concealing a pistol. Why he didn't use it, I don't know, but I'm so thankful he never did. Anyways, I don't know whatever happened to him why he played pretend, or why he tried breaking into a warehouse, but we were told he was put behind bars. That's pretty much it.